Welcome back everyone. This is the Global Summit of Singular University and this is day three, our final day. For everyone who's been watching on day one and day two and you're back, thanks and welcome again. For all new viewers, we have great content for you again today. I'm Alison Berman. I'm Pascal Finet. Super excited to have you here. Um, it really feels a little bit to me like day three, like we're all a little tired, but yeah. somehow you don't want it to end. No, you don't want it to end. We are a little tired. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about tired. So I know that we had a party yesterday, right? We did. Big, big, big party at the De Young Museum. Yeah. So for the Global Summit, Singular University took over the De Young Museum and the participants could go through the Summer of Love exhibit. Then there was a silent disco with three DJs because, you know, it's like, San Francisco is not Silicon Valley, but in the you know, light of Silicon Valley culture, you know, we had to throw it down. Totally, absolutely. I actually ended up being in bed at 9 o'clock <laughs> sleeping. I wish I could say the same. <laughs> Perfect. So what do we have in store today? So you are about to have some amazing interviews. Absolutely. So we're starting off with um, the gentleman who runs our um, summit in Canada, Oren. Uh, we've got Mark, who's an incredible social entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Uh, we get bringing on Galen, um, who's using empathy and brings it to AI. It's like super, super interesting person. Yeah. Uh, and we kick it off, I, I, or sorry, we end it off with uh, Salim, um, who uh, doesn't need any so introduction, I think. Yeah. And we're going to have like 30 minutes of free flow conversation about everything. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, Salim's super exciting. I think last um, night, David Roberts gave one of his very inspiring talks about involvement in shaping the future with technology and the ethics of technology and yeah David Roberts talk so I have the uh, the great pleasure of moderating the executive program quite often and I tell always tell people David Roberts is the one talk where I like just like drop everything and just listen it's just so yeah. mesmerizing and it, it changes every single time there's so much new stuff he's bringing in it's really amazing definitely and I love also he introduces Joseph Campbell's idea of the hero's journey I've heard him do that in different ways and it's exciting about you know building your own narrative in life and being heroic and a hero brings back good to society they don't just keep it for themselves so I always like love that idea yeah and talking about hero's journey I mean a lot of our participants a lot of the summit participants are true heroes in their own journeys right That's and true. Uh, you can see it a little bit in the background there uh, my team, the SE Ventures team, is currently putting on a, um, a whole panel around entrepreneurship, fundraising. Uh, we've got Alan Taylor from Endeavor currently speaking about fundraising. Um, so that truly is the hero's journey, the entrepreneurial Absolutely. hero's journey. So it's really cool to see this content um, embedded into the greater context of Singularity University Summit. Yeah, behind us, I just heard him saying, like, raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. Raise your hand if you ever raised capital. Raise your hand. It's, like, interesting seeing what totally. the makeup is of our audience. And you have an amazing guest today as well, right? I do. I have one of our youngest uh, speakers here who won the Google Science Fair. Uh, he is developing a robot. It's a flying robot made for uh, search and response in uh, disaster scenarios. Wow. So it's really amazing. And I think this is one of the coolest applications of technology because it's letting a robot go into an area that could be really risky for a responder. And so in that sense, removing a human from that job is keeping a human safe. So I think this is amazing. And also if the technology is able to find someone better than we are, that's amazing. And yeah. um, I recently read an article where they showed that um, they're now using robots in Fukushima to finally get into the, the really deeply radiated areas of the, the core of the reactor to figure mm -hmm. out like how to better seal the reactor, etc. So this stuff is really happening. And I believe yeah. he's bringing his robot, right? He's bringing his robot on the stage. So that will be wow. really cool. I don't think he can do a full demo. I think it'd be a bit too much in here. He's flying it on the main stage, which you can watch on the live stream. But yeah, we will have the robot up here. Wow, flying. Uh, yeah. California FAA regulations, really tough. So I'm, I'm yeah. glad he's doing it indoors. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be indoors. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's going to be a super fun packed day again. It um, is. It absolutely is. I had some really amazing conversation already over our, our breakfast. Participants are still, despite the fact that they all look very tired, <laughs> they're still super fired up about, uh, you know, what's in stock for them. Uh, throughout the day. Yeah, I think on day three, a lot of the things also bega begin to come together. And it's the time also where people have already formed some interesting relationships. They're starting to have new business ideas or ways that they can collaborate. So this is the day when everyone is 
really trying to sync up with everyone here and make the most of their time. And it's also what we talk about a lot at Singularity University about convergence. Yes. Right? We're, we're talking about the convergence of technologies, how like the technologies come together, mm -hmm. but also how like ideas and people come together. Definitely. And really, day three feels like the, the day for convergence. It, it, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Day three is the day of convergence. It's interesting when you think about what are the technologies we were talking about yesterday. We were talking about AI. We were talking about virtual reality and augmented reality with Nicholas. Um, we were talking about deep sea exploration and education technology. It's really an amazing diversification of ideas. Yeah, absolutely. So exciting day ahead of us. Yes. Um, we'll definitely keep the energy up for you guys out there. We will. We're committed um, to it. Leave comments in the Facebook thing. We love to read them. We love to respond to them. We love to interact with, with you guys out there. Uh, let us know what you want to see, what was good, what wasn't good. Um, it's super helpful for us and uh, makes, yeah. truly makes this much more interactive. Yeah, like let us know where you live, what companies you work for. If you're an entrepreneur, you know, raise your proverbial hand on Facebook. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Okay, stay tuned in just a few moments. Pascal is going to bring an amazing guest on stage. Yeah, it's going to be Oren. <laughs> That's the amazing stuff.
Hey, good morning and welcome back to Singularity Hub here on the show floor in the Expo Hall at our global summit in still foggy San Francisco. It's kind of the classic summer weather here. I'm super, super stoked to have Mark Brandt with me, an incredible social entrepreneur changing the world literally on the ground. Mark, so stoked to have you here. I'm amped to be here, man. Do me a favor. Tell us a little bit, like your like, CV is like endless. Like the, the amounts of work you're doing is staggering. Tell us probably in like a few sentences, like what are you, what are you doing? Like what is, the, what is the, the essence of Mark Brand? Sure. And I think I'm in great company. I think like we, just to segue real quick, we get intimidated by folks who get introduced to the big stage and uh, the keynotes here have been amazing. You're like, does this, humanitarian this, was on the ground for Bosnia, like all of this crazy stuff. And I think that when you're doing something that you're really passionate about, your CV just generally builds around it, right? So my work specifically is focused on food systems, system change, um, using design thinking to attack problems of homelessness, marginalization, uh, poverty, and hunger. So I'm here mm. specifically speaking Yesterday I did a keynote on uh, the future of food, wow. and I took a different uh, approach to it. I wasn't talking about eating crickets, although I love these guys. I was talking about how food is our last best hope to continue to engage our community as we get more and more wrapped by digital technology. Say more about that. Yeah, I'd love Explain to. Explain that. Give me like the 90 second. Of course, you like unfortunately can't see the whole keynote thing like right now. But sure. Give me the 90 second. Why is that? Why do you like? hold this as a as a anchor stone of your work sure we will always have to eat until they're putting MREs directly in our veins which right. of course already happens uh, most of us are going to sit at a dinner table but I feel like we've been really disconnected from the experience of food mm -hmm. so I'm a restaurateur a cook by trade and uh, I have multiple businesses that do this especially in the depth of community and I see the success around people sitting together talking about issues etc not the kid with the plate and the iPad being uh. distracted so most of the great lessons I've learned in my life have been at a dinner table, yeah. have been at a bar, uh, have been with people interacting directly. The second that we remove that last piece of our connectivity, the rest of us live a lot of the time digitally, especially if we're traveling consistently. Sure. We're living on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, every other social media platform via text message, WhatsApp, via Skype, via Google Hangouts. I want to hang out, share food, and make sure that we stay connected to each other. And I think this is the way that we can really embrace that. Like, go sit in a park, bring a picnic basket, turn your devices off, and huh. talk about what's wrong with the world. I like that a lot. We spoke when we when we just got like sitting down, and we spoke about uh, you seeing Peter Diamandis um, on stage mm -hmm. talking about abundance and the future of like uh, technology enabling us, hopefully, potentially in the future, to get to a world of abundance. We had a really interesting, like, kind of like a side note, like a like a, a different take on it. Um, yeah. I would love to dig a little bit into this. So can you, for the benefit of our viewers who weren't part of us, you know, sure. shooting, shooting back and forth, like, yeah. give us your, like, your take on it and then I, I would love to dig into it. Yeah, well, Peter's brilliant. There's no question. None of us would be sitting here today if Peter wasn't as brilliant Absolutely. as he was and as forward thinking as he was. But that aside, sometimes we make statements that are sweeping and I have a lot of triggers. I have mm -hmm. a lot of triggers because of the work I did. And when he said, you know, from 1820 until present, we've seen a reduction in poverty of 70, 73%, I think is what he said. And all the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I was like, that's just simply not the case in frame. So to reframe that, 1, pil 1 billion ish people lived on the planet at that time. Right. 1.3 billion live in extreme poverty right now. 3 billion live on less than $2.50 a day. Right. And even more, <laughs> I think it gets crazy to like 80% of the population live on less than $10. So if that's abundance, I miss, don't understand the definition, right? So I just think that it's really important to keep that frame, not to get caught up in this room is extremely privileged. Sure. And we need to continue to focus that privilege to bring everybody with us. If we're saying there's going to be more than enough food, there's more than enough water, I saw some incredible stuff. I mean, I told you I had my worldview changed on medical and, and my own condition. I think it's really important to think when you step out of here and you look at the people in the Tenderloin and the Mission who are sleeping literally on mattresses outside these doors, do they see abundance? Do they feel that the world is abundant for them? I don't think so. And I think we need to be focused on them because we're good. Right. We can continue to do the tech thing and we can continue to move forward as a planet and really fix all of our, our pieces a la ozone layer. But if we don't focus on the most marginalized, is that going to be fun for us at the end of it? Are we going to be happy with ourselves? Right. And I say no. Universally, no. Let me ask you a question. So, um, 
So I experienced this being here in the city, and I live a little bit further down in the, in the South Bay, but like, you know, every time I'm coming to the city, I'm just like overwhelmed, truly overwhelmed by the homelessness issue we have in San Francisco. Right. And there's some specific reasons around this, of course, because the city is very welcoming to homeless people. The climate is probably welcoming for people sleeping on the streets. So, you know, I get why there's probably more homeless people in this city than in other cities. Okay. Right. And it is a really hard problem to like just confront. Right. Sure. So I do as much as I can as a human being to be human to these people. Right. And not just like see them as non-existing or you know a nuisance or whatever sure how do we deal with that how do we like on a personal level i'm not talking you know like how should the city deal with this right. the country you know right. whatever right. like how do we as individuals like when we step out of these 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 halls here right like mm -hmm. into the temple line like how do we deal with it so yeah you hit three nerves for me and and one is there absolutely is no us and them mm. there's just us there right. is only us two civic duty means the citizens of the city it doesn't just mean our elected officials. It doesn't just mean our city. The city of San Francisco is doing an amazing job. They set up a department specifically to engage homelessness 11 months ago. The team is incredible. I've met them all face to face. They're embracing technologies, admitting their flaws, really trying to do this thing. That's great. Mm -hmm. We have a civic duty as humans, as citizens of the planet, to engage people who are less fortunate than us. Right. I changed my worldview on that six or seven years ago specifically and what was getting in my way and I challenged people on this was my ego. Hmm. I was scared that if I went to speak to somebody who was homeless they might ask me for something that I couldn't give them. Now I didn't have that in the front of my mind, it was in my subconscious, yeah. right? And it was, do you have, and if I was to say no, I would feel guilty, so me, 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 I, I, I. Right. Well, you know what, if you don't have it, you can simply say I don't, but I hope you're having a wonderful day and I wish oh. you the best. And interaction, homelessness is one of the biggest places of isolation. Right. So if you're in that state of isolation, just a handshake, a hello, an acknowledgement, an interaction that you're there is really important. Right. And then I think if it, you really care about it, there's so many great resources. We're across the street from Glide Church that's been around for 57 years helping with homelessness. The first gay marriage was there. They're a place of inclusion. There's places you can direct people to help them out. And then lastly, I've been working on a digital platform, which is a little outside of my scope, but to connect all of the people who have empathy, all of the agencies that homeless folks can't navigate or find, and everybody on the ladder of homelessness. The part about that is a lot of the people who are homeless are invisible. They're living in cars, they're crashing on couches, they're living in shelters. You're seeing the tip of a very, very, very big iceberg. So let me ask you a question. So we, we work a lot with entrepreneurs. There's a lot of entrepreneurs in this, uh, in this group here attending the, the summit. How would you, as an entrepreneur, being empathetic, caring about these issues, mm -hmm. how would you go about this? Like, what, what is, how do I connect with this? Yeah, and I think the best way is as a human is to set your tech aside for a second mm. and to step out and find out where you can fit into it. And the second part is there's other folks like me who are working on platforms who you can support. Right. You know, yesterday I got the, the chance to see a panel and one of the gentlemen on the panel said, I've created a two-page uh, executable document so it's a contract to be able to use X, Y, or Z. It's the simplest contract that was ever created on the internet. I was like, I need that for my platform. So I think us as a community will be developing the platform that I'm building. I'm not set in an office with a, a developer and right. a team like, Find somebody who's doing the work you align with, and this is so important. I care about people in poverty and humans specifically. Other folks right there care about hunger in Africa and in right. impoverished areas. They want to deliver stuff. Whatever you're passionate about is your genius. Mm. And bring your genius to the table. Don't bring, people come to me and say, can I help you cook? Right. And I always say, do you know how to cook? <laughs> yeah, right. And nine times out of 10, they say no. Like, uh, why would I want you to come cook if you don't know how? Right. Like, what do you actually do? And like, I'm a lawyer, but that's way more valuable to me right. than you chopping onions. I can find somebody to chop onions. But if you can come and donate a, like an hour a month or two right. hours a month to legal, to somebody who really needs your genius, whether it's UX, whether it's entrepreneur mentorship, right. that's your gift. Give it to people who need it. I love that. Let me give uh, our audience a quick plug. Okay. How can they support you? Because you're on this show, you're right now here on air, sure. you're doing amazing work. So. 
how do we support you? How do we like? How do we plug into your world and support your work? One hundred percent. So I am uh, on Instagram of all things at Mark Brand Mark with a K. Uh, my adventures are all there. The stuff that I'm doing is all there. I've focused on that platform in specific because I don't find that it gets me into a rabbit hole. And I love imagery. I'm a designer as well, and I love that space. Please come and hang out with me there, and uh, we can chat. Awesome. So Instagram is the place. It is Mark dot brand That's mark right. with a k um cool let me ask you a couple more questions i'm, I'm, I'm really curious about like your work and like your the view of the uh of the world um with everything you said and you know again like in in my own world like going out on the streets of san francisco seeing the homelessness person as just one example of all the pressing problems sure. we have in the world Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Hugely optimistic. All right, why? Hugely optimistic. Empathy, my friend. I mean, empathy can save us, period. And people will be like, you're a crazy person and everything's going to explode. We're going to war with North Korea tomorrow. We, as humans, are built and hardwired to care about each other and be in community, period. Mm. I started a token project. I don't have one with me, um, but at my butcher shop and diner in the downtown east side of Vancouver, one of the largest open-air drug markets in North America, a place of mental illness, of disparity, of homelessness. Of, like, it's crazy there. I opened a business in the center of it. Mm. I started a project a few years afterwards because people kept saying, how can I help? Right. And like, well, I don't want to create a solution that only wealthy people can help with, right, right, right. or only people from the middle class can help with. I want everybody to be able to participate. So I created a plastic token, and on it there's a pig that signifies the, the logo of my building. On the back it says sandwich. And so you can hand that to somebody in the street when they ask for money for they're hungry. When they say they're hungry, you hand it to them. They know the building. It's been there since 57. And they can come and redeem it, sit down at the diner, have a coffee, hang out, feel part of a community, because they are. Wow. Or take it to go. And so when I launched it, I thought maybe two or three redemptions, right? Right. A day, and I'd be stoked because we have to talk to somebody when we hand yeah, them Yeah, something. totally. The first day was over 120. We cracked 100,000 this year. It's just skyrocketed to a point, and that's where my hope comes from. Huh. If people have to come all the way to my neighborhood to engage in this program, 90% of people do anyway, some do it digitally, and then go out in the street and do this in a neighborhood that they wouldn't necessarily feel safe a lot of the time, which is a huge misnomer, then I got a lot of hope. There's only 631,000 people who live downtown Vancouver. If 100,000 people of that have participated because they care, yeah, we're good. We just need to give people channels to participate. Right. You saying, how can I help? That was a genuine ask. And if people can't get involved, how can we expect to secure our future together? We, we can't. So that's what my main focus for two years, here at the Stanford D School for a year, um, through the Think School of Leadership, I'm just laser focused on being able to connect us so we can actually connect. That is amazing. Um, let me take it one level up. I'm sure. curious, so that is the, how do I help as a person? Right. Uh, probably as my closing question, how do I help on a systems level? So how do I, like, I am sure there's a bunch of people out there right now watching you saying like, this is amazing. And, How do I create the token system? How do sure. I come up with that idea? Yeah. Right? Like, how do I embed this into my business, into my existing business? Sure. Like, how can we do this? So, two streams. One, do it. Um, we launched a token project here with a group that um, I helped to mentor out of Stanford Farm uh, called Farming Hope. You can redeem tokens and help people out who are cooking taquitos, etc. at the Ferry Terminal building on Wednesdays and I think Sundays. Good plug for those guys. I love you. Uh, and then secondary, Be a part of hiring people who need the employment. Now, let me be more specific there. In the service industry, we're right. experiencing a massive gap right now in skilled labor. Because kids were like, I could go be a cook for $15 an hour and work 12 hours a day. No, thank you. I'm good on that. Right. I love to cook, but I don't love it that much. I'm going to go code for Google. Yep. And so we have this huge gap. Instead of seeing that as a problem, I saw it as an opportunity to engage with people who have developmental disabilities, who have mental illness, who are coming out of recidivism, et cetera, et cetera, and getting them into training programs and getting them to work. That's awesome. So turnover in the restaurant business is around 80% a year, or the service industry, everybody who's helping us here today, per annum, because people are off to another right. career. Right, right, right. That's incredibly expensive to people in the service industry to replace people and train them consistently. With people who are barriered in any of those categories, turnover is less than 30%. They're not hunting for your job. Wow. You know, there's a whole different mind frame. And most importantly, the people who work for you outside of that 
forget what you're doing and they turn over yeah, less. Absolutely. There's your impact. Get people off the street by giving them purposeful employment, something they care about. That's amazing. So it's two things. Do it yeah. and get the right people involved, right? And like, one more. Do it. Do it. <laughs> yeah, right. Just go do On it. that note, yes. um, the thing you all should do is you go to Instagram right now, go to mark.brand, follow Mark, check out his stuff, see how you can help him, get inspired. I know you're also teaching. There's a whole bunch of like teaching methodologies around this. Yeah. Check that stuff out and go do it. Absolutely. Mark, thank you so much. It was an incredible pleasure. pleasure. Um, we're back live in a few minutes. Thank you so much, Mark. It was amazing. Great to spend time, man. Thank you. All right.
And we're back at Singularity Hub here at the Expo Hall at the Global Summit with a very, very special guest, Salim Ismail. Salim was the founding executive director of Singularity University, was here from day one, built most of our programs in the, in the early days. Uh, you also founded Brickhouse, which was Yahoo's incubator program here in San Francisco, have done a whole bunch of other stuff. And today you are the chairman and a co-founder of EXO Works. Uh, Fast Track Institute and a whole bunch of other stuff and you're like traveling the world giving speeches to like the most important people on the planet pretty much so uh, uh, some of that is true some yeah. of that is true <laughs> so um, you've been talking on stage here uh, quite a bit and you're actually going to be on stage again yeah um, what's the I, I'm curious like what is the the main message today like, so I think we understand that exponential technologies are disrupting us I get I get that I think the question is now how do you apply it and how do you kind of na manage that transition into the world? We are in a frickin' mess uh, as technology is a forcing function that is causing massive disruption in all of our institutions and all of our societal structures. And so we need to figure that out. And our existing leaders, our, my thesis is our existing leadership can't do it. They were too stuck in the, in the way they did things before. You, if you're in the leadership position in a big automotive company, it's because you've been doing things for 30 years in that particular way. Right. And you have deep insight into that world. And now we have autonomous cars coming, we have uh, uh, other mechanisms coming. You, none of your experience applies. And the same thing is happening in government. And so I'm thinking about, okay, uh, we can talk about how you change leaders, but we actually need to change all of our institutions. And so I'm focused today now on more on how do you update our institutions like education, uh, voting systems, uh, democracy is broken, I would even argue. And so how do we deal with that? Wow. No small undertaking. The, the title of the talk is, How Do You Fix Civilization? So, and you actually did it. a TED talk about this, right? I did. I did. So everyone, after this, not now, after this, go on Google, find the TED talk. It's a really good TED talk. I saw it, uh, saw it a little you. while ago. It's a really fantastic thing. Yeah. Um, so how are we doing this? Because it's... It's a really, I mean, it's a tough thing to do, right? It's, it's one thing to say, hey, here's the recipe to become an exponential organization, yeah. which, by the way, you've got an amazing, amazing book called Exponential Organizations. Uh, it's a bestseller book, uh, recommended by top CEOs today. A lot of, uh, I heard... Seems to be required reading at Fortune 1000 right. board level. Right, inclusive of uh, some of the largest consulting firms, which basically make this like total like required reading for everyone in the organization, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's one thing to do this on like a company level, right? Yes. And that's complex enough. But yeah. how do you do it in like more the societal level? So I'm do, I've got kind of three buckets in my world right now. I've got ExoWorks, which runs 10-week sprints inside big companies to solve their immune system problem. Right? Mm -hmm. If you try disruptive innovation in a big company, the rest of the company attacks you because they're so architected to doing things the old way. So we've solved that problem. We find we run this 10-week process framework and we can move a a leadership culture management thinking two and a half years ahead in 10 weeks. And the opportunity cost of that is huge. And so we've done that, we piloted it with Procter & Gamble a couple of years ago. We've done it now seven times and we've got a company that does that. And then I've said, okay, let's take that and apply it to public sector. Because mm -hmm. in, in the public sector, our existing policies are the immune system, right? You try and update uh, transportation, the taxis fight you. you, try and update education, the teachers unions fight you. And so dealing with that is we've, we've kind of applied it at a city level. And so we've created something called the Fast Track Institute, which runs this and applies this at a city level. And the value proposition is we find we can solve a problem facing a city for about one-tenth the current cost. Right. Uh, and so we've done it three times in Medellin in Colombia, and we're just starting this week with the mayor of Miami on the future of transportation in Miami. Let me stay there for a second. Like the, I find cities really interesting because they're this like linchpin for change in my world, right? We had these, yeah. So there's a one trend like this, for the first time ever in history, human history, we're living more, more in urban context than in, in rural context, yeah. globally. And then cities become more powerful as, as in, a, in a weirdly weakening uh, federal context. Yeah, very right? clear. Yeah. So where do you see that, that future play out? So uh, we think that you know, at a local level, if you look at the big cities like Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Tokyo, Shanghai, they're bigger and more complex than any country was 100 years right. ago. Right. right. So they're gaining in size and complexity. They have low access to resources of their own. And now we find the world is being run by these city-states uh, rather than nation-states. Um, the whole Brexit, Trump, etc., all of that, is not a left versus right issue. It's a rural versus urban issue. That's the voting lines there. And so as we look at that, Banning Garrett, one of our fellow faculty here, uh, who works for the Atlantic Council, made a really profound comment to me. He goes, you guys are interested in solving grand challenges. 
if you solve grand challenges in cities, then you solve the grand challenge. Mm. If you don't solve them in cities, you don't solve them. And that really hit me. Uh, and then Paul Sappho talks a lot about the, the rise of the city-state and the, the de-emphasis of the nation-state. And so we operate at city level because we can get things done. Right? Right. Nothing happens at the federal level now for a decade or two, certainly not in the U.S., and certainly not in Europe. Uh, and so we need to operate and we need to act fast. And so we're operating at city level. How do you see that, um, that tension being resolved? Because in a lot of ways, like as much as the federal level, wow, this whole place is currently falling apart. Amazing. Uh, it's day three. It's day three. Um, how do you think the, the tension between like, the city level becoming more powerful, yeah. the federal level probably weakening in power, but currently exerting a lot of like weird stuff. They're holding, so I, stuff I'm, I'm on, Canadian. Right. You have federal, provincial, or state, and then yep. city. The provinces can uh, veto funding down to the city level. So they're basically holding the cities hostage. Wow. So right now you have to pay homage to that, et cetera. But it's like, when you think about uh, middle management, is always the stressor in, in big companies. Mm. We need less and less of it today. Right. In the same way we need less intermediary levels of government and they won't go quietly into the night. And so we see massive tension globally around it. And this is the challenge. You can't change that system easily. It's a log jam. Yeah. So you have to re-architect it from the bottom up. And so that's what we're looking to do. That's amazing. Um, is there anything that scares you today in terms of like yeah. the, the technology, the change we're seeing? So the technology does not scare me okay. because we've seen, uh, I have a great little anecdote um, from eBay. You know, uh, you, you know, there's an interesting question about, we worry about technology because people might do bad things with them. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, if you look at eBay or Craigslist, you can just as easily do good things or bad things. Mm -hmm. I can just as easily mask my email address, pretend to uh, send yep. you a MacBook, sure. uh, collect the money, and then vanish. Um, and so you have these, several of these open systems where people can go do good or bad. So anthropologists and sociologists have looked at these systems and said, okay, what's the actual ratio? Right? But good with that. Well, it turns out it's something like 10,000 to 1. So there's 10,000 positive transactions on yep. eBay, same with Craigslist, to every negative one. Yep. So if that's the case, something like drones, our first instinct is just ban the drones right. and then slowly open that tap. What we should be saying is let anybody do whatever the hell they want. Minnesota ice fishermen, go to town. You know, drones to plant trees, go to town. And then police the negative use cases as they surface. So the, the, we're taking way too long to take the advan advantage of what technology is right. offering today in all of our institutions. And that stressing point is what we're seeing globally. That's interesting. I was at eBay in the early days, and I remember like, we had these like, um, company beliefs, rallies and beliefs, right? We had these little, like, on the back of our batch, they were the, the printed, and the first one is, we believe people are basically good. Yeah. And the basically is actually an important part, right? Because we don't, we are not naive. Yeah. We don't think people are all good but we believe that their, their, their first and foremost intention is good. And we see that in the data, and this is where Peter and Stephen identified this in abundance, right. where your amygdala is, is clock looking for bad news, and you're 10 times more likely to listen to bad news than good news, right? right? This is why Fox News does very well. Um, How do you deal, though, with some of the new technologies have so much more destructive, potential destructive power, yeah. right? So it's like... It's one thing to like have a gun in your hand and be able to like you know fire eight bullets. Yeah, I think there's a whole different game if you're like engineering a deadly virus or something. Right? Yeah. So uh, certainly the amplitude is increasing, right? right. So uh, the way I entered SU was that I did give a talk at NASA uh, just before uh, the founding conference, where I said the the damage that one person can do with technology is growing exponentially. Our ability to limit information from that person is dropping exponentially. That's not a great place right. for the crop. So that's kind of that's how they got. They, they said, "Hey, come to the founding conference, uh, etc." And then Peter said, "Do you want to run it?" There you go. <laughs> Here I am. Um, uh, uh, I, I, eight years in, nine years in now, mm -hmm. I'm actually profoundly more optimistic than I was mm -hmm. then. Way more optimistic so because of that. Was the... Because of that comment that people fundamentally do good things, gotcha. and because the uh, upside potential of these new technologies is so profound. Yeah. that we have awesome possibilities ahead, right? Uh, the abundance that we'll see in solar and in water and in healthcare and in education, this is going to be unbelievable what happens in this next 10, 20 years. But our existing leadership fundamentally don't get it. And that's a problem. So do you think there's hope for educating those? Like taking no. on with, wow, <laughs> okay. No, you cannot. It's like teaching an old dog new tricks. They're too stuck in their old patterns. What you have to do is actually create new leaders. So it's a bit like the French Revolution? Yeah, you actually totally need to, but you know, it doesn't need to be violent. Yeah, no, I understand. At the very least, we have generational change, yeah. right? 
But you look at somebody like Vitalik Buterin, right? This, this is a guy re-architecting the world from the bottom up using completely new technologies. And if you're a, a 50-year-old banker uh, at the World Bank, you cannot get your head around what's new. Mm. I think there's some bylaw, by the way, that says you have to be under 25 to deal with blo the blockchain. <laughs> it's written in some code <laughs> so, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, for right? sure. Like, none of us freaking get it. We yeah. can't even, can barely spell it. So, uh, as we see this new world order, I think what we should be doing is finding those people yeah. and just turn the goddamn world over to them. I mean, they'll figure it out. Right. And most of the time, we're the problem. Right. And we're the we're kind of stuck with, well, that's dangerous, that's careful. The world is too different today to deal with it. It's fascinating to see some big companies, Fortune 500s, now have very, very young people in in very strong positions working directly with the CEO exactly for yes. that reason, right? Because yes. the CEO is like, you know, 50 plus and says like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I barely right. know how to use my phone, right? That's right. Going back to eBay, I love the story about... Uh, the CEO realizing in 2011, 2012 that the, the company was in deep trouble, hiring the young kid and saying, go to Australia, right. uh, go, for, go off to the edge, come back, and then we'll implement whatever you do. And the, to think about the courage that that takes, and their market cap went up $50 billion in six months. Yeah. That's an amazing story. And we see more and more of that, we, we, but we need to see a thousand times more, not like a, a little story here or there. In terms of technology, so you, you have a, an incredibly broad overview of like what's happening in the world. I've seen you speak many, many times and you know, we chat a lot. Um, is there a particular set or a particular technology, a set of technologies or technology which you get tr truly excited about in terms of like its uh, disruptive power? I think the three that hit me directly would be solar energy uh -huh. because we will rapidly turn solar. Right. The poorest countries in the world are the sunniest countries in the world, so that's uh, well, solar is one of them. I think CRISPR and what's possible in biotech is another uh, unbelievable capability. We have one of our GSP-15 alumni that has a sequences a, a cancer tumor and then goes and sequences a normal cell and you can just clip out the difference between CRISPR. Mm -hmm. If he's correct, we'll be able to cure cancer in anybody in about two weeks for about $8,000. Right. That's kind of like a mind boggling, yep. right? And so you see things like that, that becomes really powerful. And I think the third one would be the blockchain. Yeah. Um, because we have finally, the internet's been an open communication protocol and we've tried with massive difficulty to secure transactions and right. have authentication. Yep. But now we have the authentication layer and the possibilities of that are very, very profound. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's like, as you know, I was at Mozilla back in the day and um, uh, Brendan Eich, the guy who invented JavaScript yeah. and built the Firefox web browser, um, he and I always talked about like how we screwed up the web by not building transaction into the into the browser as yeah. a secure layer. Right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and Actually, I think now when Tim Berners Lee designed it, he had a, he had a get and a put function. Yeah, right. We implemented the get. We didn't implement the put, and that's that's caused a lot of hassle. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me change tack for the last like I don't know five minutes or so. Sure. Um, so you're doing an amazing, amazing talk, which is like legendary. Which I think is not on your like typical like talk list, which is called the meaning of life. Okay, you did this at uh, our global solutions program GSP this year, and I think it ran for a record-breaking eleven, 11 hours. hours. Yeah, <laughs> so it started with like post dinner. Yeah, and ten o'clock, uh, alcohol mandatory. Yeah. Um, here's the thesis. You know, we have this, these blockchain, CRISPR, bi biotech, solar, it ra AI. It radically changes the notion of life itself. Mm -hmm. Like, why are we here? Uh, uh, what's the purpose of life? How do we, you know, Plato or Socrates asked this question, how should we conduct ourselves? Right? We don't have a clear answer for that. And this started in GSP9 where, where we had the students, they go through the first month, learn about their technologies, and their mind is blown. And they can't actually practically apply the thinking to the billion person problem because their mind is scattered asking right. these big questions. So we thought, okay, they're, they're like totally useless right now. Let's have this <laughs> session and at least give them a framing around this. Yeah. And so uh, uh, it's been some stuff I've been looking at for a long time. It's just an amalgamation of looking at Western philosophy versus Eastern philosophy. Uh, how to, you know, for example, we live in a world that's completely predicated on growth, progress, evolution, or improvement. Completely. Mm -hmm. We have almost no idea on what is the actual process by which growth happens. Mm. Right? So we, what we do in the session is analyze a little bit, lay a bit of background, and then say, here's the steps, and then now let's apply it to life areas. Uh, and then we find, you get kind of instant wisdom when you do that. And it's all the way with a lively discussion. I throw up a diagram on the human condition, we discuss it for an hour, and then we throw up a diagram on truth, and we discuss it for an hour, and we go That's totally amazing. 
as long as anybody wants to go. The, the terrible promise I make is I'll be the last person to leave. Yes. Which is a really bad thing to say <laughs> with, with 25 year old for sure um, uh, people that don't need sleep. Yeah, yeah, so what happened this year was I bumped into a bunch of our students, um, participants, um, probably at like nine o'clock or so. Yeah. And I was like, hey, how was the session with Salim? And they were like, well, we just finished. <laughs> we just, we're now going to bed for like an hour or so. And yeah, it was, yes. it was pretty epic. And then I asked them the second question. I was like, so, okay, so you did the meaning of life. So what is the meaning of life? And the blank stares I got, and the only <laughs> answer I got was, I think the best answer I got was 42. Yes. Um, so what is the meaning of life? Well, I think the purpose of life is to grow. Uh -huh. and, and if you can understand, if you can kind of see that, like exponential, I've got a, I had a discussion with Ray, and I said, isn't all growth exponential? Mm. By definition, uh, you have these little S curves in everything that we do. Um, and he was like, oh, let me think about that. Um, and uh, we've got, we've got this kind of fundamental paradigm driving us. I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by what is the nature and structure of reality. Mm. Like, in, for interestingly, as big as you want to go in the universe, or as small as you want to go, you have infinity in either direction. So really, if that's the case, then it's really just the process on how you're operating. And so if we can understand the process around some of this, and it basically breaks down into two things. There's either a dramatically uncertain growth process, and then we have a consolidation process. And we see this archetypally in everything we do. You study uh, a topic and then you take an exam, right? You uh, try and learn a driver's license, you take an exam. Right. You have a sales and marketing, then you have accounting and fulfillment. And so we find the, uh, most life functions can bifurcate to one of those two. And it's useful to see that in play. You fall in love and then you get married, right? That's the consolidation. And so that, that kind of ratcheting, cyclical, fractal pattern is fairly archetypal in how we do things. So do you think that we are like... So that was that whole talk right there. So you don't need 11 hours. <laughs> I think the 11 hours version sounds pretty fun, though. It's pretty fun. And you actually did one here, right? Um, I did it on the, the first Monday, night. On yeah. the Sunday because night. Because some of the alumni said, work. Uh, so I, I do it on demand, and we do it now. I've probably done it 30 times. Yeah. And what's great is I learn something every single time. Right. So that's, that's so fun. I think that's what I love most about this community is like, it's just such a privilege to be in the community because I yeah. learn all the time. It's like I mean, I, I've had the privilege of leading the executive program for seven years. Right. So having heard, I've heard every single one of our speakers like 15, 20, 60, <laughs> totally. you know, autonomous car discussion, done it 60 times. <laughs> After hearing that discussion 60 times, I can pretend to speak about that. Yeah. Right? I can pretend to speak about the blockchain. I, as my wife says, I can pretend to speak about anything now. So there right. we go. That's fantastic. Um, I'm curious, with all you're up to now, what is next for you? Like, what is the, where do you see Salim in like, you know, the, the I, I five to 10 years? I actually want to fix civilization. Huh. I, I think we need to re-architect it from the bottom up. Uh, what was exciting to me by when Peter said come and run Singularity was, uh, how often do you get to create an institution, a university? Like, that never happens, right? right? So how can you say no to that? So having gone through that process and now understanding, we've understood how do you solve the immune system problem in both private and public sectors, I'm thinking let's just go for broke because we need to fix the world and re-architect right. it and, and it's got to be done. And it's got to be done soon because, I mean, let me be really provocative. Uh, if you look at what's happening in the world today, you could argue that we have failed. Mm -hmm. If we had really educated the world's leadership, then you should not see Brexit, you should not see... Right the presidential race is the way sure. they're being run. And so we're moving too slowly, mm -hmm. right? It's great that we have 20,000 alumni. We should have 200,000, 2 million right. out there. And so we need to really get our act together. And I think we're starting to get there. Uh, the new president in Argentina is an alumni. Yeah. And uh, uh, Matt Hagman, who's one of our AP alumni, is now running for Congress. Right. And so we're starting to see really the, the model bite. But I think we need to re-architect the underlying institutions and create mechanisms for that. And that's what my talk will be about. Love it. With that being said, I actually don't want to keep you from doing the talk because I know I'm there's gonna, a whole bunch of I'm people finish sitting my there. Slides, so. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, in typical yeah. Salim style. One very last question. Sure. If people are interested in your work, um, the amazing things you're doing, where do they find that information? What is the best way for people um, to like sort, like get a, wrap their head around Salim? Look up uh, exo.works. My website is salimasmell.com, and we have the Fast Track Institute. Perfect. And I've done two TED talks. One is called Occupy Mail Street, and the other one is called fixing civilization perfect so two TED talks three websites we put this into our show notes Salim it was an incredible honor and pleasure to have great, you here great to have you great um, to be here we'll be back in just a few minutes Salim will be on the main stage in something like 40-ish 50 minutes yeah. he still has to do his slides in typical Salim style thank you so much for having us great to be here thank you
And we're back live here at Singularity Hub on the show floor of our global summit in San Francisco. This is my last interview for this summit and I couldn't, truly couldn't imagine a more interesting and better guest than Galen Buckwalder. Galen was the inventor of the matching algorithm at eHarmony, the dating site, which was the very first dating site in the world using a, an algorithm to match people. 
He's today the chief science officer at SciML, and we'll talk a whole bunch about SciML today, where he's using psychological assessments to bring um, uh, machine learning and robotics into the, the truly the human uh, realm. Galen, I'm so stoked to have you here. Ah, um, pleasure. You spent like literally a whole career on like trying to figure out like how people how people tick, right? Um, and you've done this at eHarmony, and we'll talk a little bit about the dating space a little bit later. But what are there's this concept of psychometrics, right. which is really like your life's work, right? Absolutely. Like what are psychometrics, and and how do we use them in yeah. in a technology sense? Yeah, psychometrics literally is um, the process of applying numbers to human behaviors. So when we know that as people we have um, traits like intelligence, um, like openness, like we have emotions, all of these um, exist, but if we want to study them, we have to be able to measure them. Um, the process of quantifying um, these latent traits is a very kind of arduous and systematic process. Um, but basically it boils down to you hypothesize something that exists, then you collect evidence of how it um, exists with internally with the measurements, the items that you're using, and then how it relates to other constructs that you hypothesize. So ultimately you get to a position where, you know, you say it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, you, you know, you have anger, you yeah. have um, openness, uh, yeah. or some personality trait. So that's um, the process of psychometrics. Applying it online has, to me, always seemed like a, a gift to psychologists mm -hmm. because um, online, you know, we're able to, for the first time, apply psychometrics at scale. Um, the, the biggest problem in academic research around human traits has been simply that you know, you look at, at studies of even 20 years ago, you were, you were surprised if you saw an N of 200 subjects. And that probably took the, the poor um, dissertation student, yeah. you know, a couple of years to collect. But now, um, with the, the internet, with crowdsourcing sites like Mechanical Turk, we're able to get thousands of people to take questionnaires overnight, mm -hmm. uh, which has sped up the pace of, of uh, personality and uh, emotion research just, just exponentially. So it's really exciting time to... Interesting. Uh, Let me ask you a question. Like, so when we measure, particularly a concept like personality, um, in your view, and I think this is the age-old question, is like, how much of personality is is stuck? Is like, you know, it is who we are, and it will pretty much always be who we are. Right. And how much of it is a fluid concept, which changes pretty dynamically in terms of like, you know, my evolution as a as a as a being. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, it's a great question, and it's one we're still figuring out. Um, there there are clearly dimensions that that change minimally across the lifespan um, but but there's always change um, you know particularly around periods of, of great kind of relationship and social change so you know we see major personality shifts like around the, the time when um, when young people go to college, uh, you know, a great increase in openness and, uh, you know, kind of ex exploration behaviors. Um, you also see changes around the time uh, that people get into long-term relationships. Um, 
so you, you probably see a common theme there that personality changes most in response to relationships, um, which tells you a lot about our brain. I think yeah. you know that um, you know our, our brain, our personality. I think you know it forms um, you know fairly early on by you know seven or eight. Um, it, it also forms around six dimensions that we've only recently really nailed down. That's the hexaco uh, model, that's right? That's the hexaco model. It's, can you explain which, this a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, over the, the generations, there's been, you know, psychologists have always, you know, had theories about personality. You know, Freud had the theory of... Um, you know, the subconscious and um, the unconscious. Um, you know, Jung had the archetypes. Um, and then there was also a very empirical uh, aspect of psychology that looked at, at personality in using uh, advanced analytics, primarily factor analysis. Um, interestingly, in the late 80s, early 90s, both of those converged into uh, what was initially called the ocean model or the five factor model, which was openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Um, in, in really the past five to 10 years, uh, six dimension has been added, um, honesty, um, and additionally, um, you know, we've, we've shifted from using the somewhat pejorative term eroticism to calling that dimension emotionality. Gotcha. Um, so now we have these six dimensions, which really, for the first time, give us a rock-solid understanding of personality. I mean, this exists everywhere, huh. every culture, you know, both genders, um, it, 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 it's really solid. It gives us something to start to look at, you know, how much we change over the course of lifespan. Um, again, it, you know, we, we see subtle movements in these, um, but, but by and large, um, you know, the, the general structure of our personality stays the same. So, you know, in terms of online applications, that's where at SciML we're, we're really excited to not just measure people um, for academic, you know, research purposes, yeah. but to use that in applied settings. Um, you know, uh, my partner, uh, Dave Herman, and I had worked at a uh, financial services company called Payoff uh, before we started SciML. And there, um, you know, we, we were able to uh, understand how much credit risk was related to personality wow. factors that you can just use the hexaco and, and sounds a little scary or it it um i mean I, in the shoes of like the yeah the it, person it, applying it, for credit for if, example if handled in the wrong way i think i think it could be yeah. um what what we're our approach is is that um we only use it in the context of of self-insight. So we're not going to be using this um, in a way that people don't understand. Um, and we also think that in the context of self-insight, um, people are able to then start taking control of their personality. They understand it. They, they can um, better understand why they have problems with credit. Um, and then they can, you know, work kind of in conjunction with their personality yeah. to do what it takes for them. Um, 
that's that's um, a very critical point about uh, applying this research. Is um, you know for for SciML, we we envision our AI um, to ultimately be empathy engines. Mm -hmm. That um, you know we know uh, a lot of you know what what's good about humanity. We know that gratitude is is hugely powerful and hugely beneficial to our very brain. Yeah. So if we can start using you know this this information and helping using machines to help us understand and and um, advance our own empathy abilities, our own ability to be grateful, that that's when it seems like it's a very positive thing. Yeah. And um, you're applying this also to robotics, right? The plan is to like make robots more human? Very much. Um, you know, we think like right now, um, you know, we're, we're using it to, uh, you know, just to, uh, one instance that we're using uh, this technology is with uh, uh, people who have abused drugs and are trying to stay off of them. Yeah. So we have a bot that our, um, our brilliant developers, uh, Grace G and Eugene Wang, shout out, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that they have um, developed these uh, AI systems um, that are capable of interacting with people that are experiencing um, you know, desires to use drugs in a very empathetic, understanding way. Um, they, uh, in addition to understanding personality, uh, we're putting a lot of effort into understanding emotion, which is our, our short-term mood state. Yeah. So, you know, it, no matter what our personality is, you know, if something really bad happens, we're going to be sad or we're going to be angry. And, and that's going to influence everyone, how they, how they react. So we want to be able to understand someone's long-term, you know, characteristics, their yeah. personality. But then we, we react in the moment also based on their emotions. So, you know, we, with the uh, drug abuse prevention program, we check in every morning with the people um, to get a read on, you know, whether they're, they're feeling angry or happy, um, what their energy level is, um, because sometimes with, with drug abuse, if you're feeling really high yeah. and good, right, that, that's a, a risk. So um, based on all that information, then we react, you know, we give people exercises to do, basic cognitive behavioral therapy approaches, um, but throughout all of this, the machines learn. Yeah. Um, so we think, you know, that given given the machine, this understanding of us, this understanding of people as growing um, through self understanding, through under empathy towards others, um, that that puts a very different light on AI. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I don't think, you know, if, if Elon Musk was thinking about AI yeah. in this context, would he be afraid of it? Right. Um, well, so, I also can totally see the applications if we're thinking about uh, particular machines in the form of physical machines, robots becoming much more embedded in our lives. Mm -hmm. We want them to be, likely we want them, not all of them, right? Like a yeah. the cooking robot doesn't need to be empathetic, I guess. Right. Probably he needs to because if I feel down, he should cook me or, you know, it should cook yeah. me comfort food, yeah. right? Right. Um, 
but I can totally see the implication. I'm really excited about your work. Um, before I have my last question for you for this interview, where can people learn more about uh, your work, PsychML? How can they probably get involved? Yeah, um, we our site is at uh, psyml.co. .co. Um, we're developing that uh, quite quite rapidly now, so you'll start to see that. Uh, I have a Medium uh, page at, uh, at Gail and Buckwalter. You can look look up That's what awesome. we're writing there. Okay, so cyml.co and then check out Medium. My very last question, and I'm sorry we have to go there because uh, you brought the world eHarmony um, with online dating has, has gone through so many iterations, right? We had eHarmony and then we had Match and uh, then we had like plenty of fish and now we've got Tinder and yep. do you think it's today the way to actually find your spouse and like full disclosure I found my spouse the old way and I'm very very happily married to like the most amazing woman on the planet um, but do you think like on average like the the machines are better to find our perfect match than than uh, you know like the the, the old fashioned yeah. way yeah well there is some data starting to, to show up. Uh, there was a large-scale study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science uh, just about two years ago, I think, um, that looked at eHarmony, they looked at Match, they looked at um, you know your, your method of uh, yeah. dating in the <laughs> wild, as we call it. Yeah. Um, but what they found was that eHarmony, the divorce rate, was significantly lower than Match, but Match was also significantly lower than the wild. So it seems like, you know, just the process of looking at your potential partners in uh, a more, you know, kind of systematic way. I mean, marriage is not... Um, I mean, marriage requires the passion and and the uh, you know kind of the chemistry. Yeah. Um, but if you rely on that, that is not a good start for marriage. And I think right. I think in the wild that's a temptation. Um, so um, yeah, I, I I think there can be advantages to a more systematic exploration that online dating. Uh, kind of enhances. Okay, now I have to ask you a very last cheeky question. Yeah. Where did you meet your wife? Uh, the old-fashioned way. Uh, in, in a class I was teaching. Fantastic. I love it. So all of you guys, get out there, find your match. If you don't find your match out there, use apps and definitely, definitely keep an eye on SciML and Galen's incredible work. Um, I, I truly believe your work will influence and change the way we think about machines interacting with us, uh, making them truly more human. That is it for me for today at Singularity Hub. We have way more amazing interviews in stock for you uh, from my dear colleagues, Lisa K. Solomon and Alison Baum, so they will come back later. For now, thank you so much. See you all soon, and check out the links in the Singularity Hub uh, page underneath this video.
We are back here at Singularity Hub, right on the show floor of our wonderful Global Summit. Report says that it's still foggy out there. I haven't seen the sky for the last three days. For the better, by the way, it's amazing in here. I'm super stoked to have a dear colleague of mine here, um, Heba, our Director of Community Engagement. And Heba, you've been working on a thing for quite a while. <laughs> yes. And um, we're super stoked to have you here. Tell us about the thing. So we've been working on this awesome thing. Uh, we recently launched our Singularity U Hub app. Uh, this app was really the work, the accumulation of amazing work that we've been doing for about a year and a half now, where we've been wanting to really give our community the chance to see itself and connect with one another. So um, you can discover people, you can discover events, you can stay up to date with all of our amazing hub content, all in one place, all on the go, all on your phone. And it's for Android. Android. Correct? We actually and recently launched Android, and we're on uh, iOS. So we're we're both on iTunes and Android Google Play. So the thing you should do right now is pick up your phone. If you're not watching this on your phone, otherwise, like take a little break and watch this first, and then go to your phone. But go to your iOS or Android store, and what do they need to f look for to find the, the app? Singularity you Hub. Um, and we'll come right up, download it, create a profile, and just start searching all of these amazing people and connect with them. Yeah, I actually took the, uh, the app, I have the app, of course, on my phone, and I was walking through here, and people like approached me, and I didn't really know who they were. You know, yeah. they're like, hey, Pascal, and I, I mean, I see so many people, I'm like, uh, I kind of know you, right? <laughs> so I did the, like, the, the, the yep. sneaky, you yep. know, like on the apps, like, oh, wait like, a second, who you. are you, you, you know? Yep. <laughs> so it's, it's a super interesting app because you've got like the whole community in there Absolutely. and you can connect with them, right? I've got their LinkedIn, often if there's their LinkedIn profiles, their websites, etc. right? Yeah, so in your profile you can choose to put whatever you want. So you can put in your LinkedIn, your Instagram, your Facebook, your Twitter, and your email and people can directly link up with you. 
And the great thing is, because obviously we're on mobile, it shows you automatically. So when you open the app, your feed shows you all of the people that have just joined that are near you. So if you open it here, you'll see all of these familiar faces that are here with us right. today. So what are you... Um what is the use case? Like, what am I using it for? So, of course, like, my use case was just, like, the jug my memory use yeah. case, right? But it's, there's so much more richness in the Absolutely. app, right? Absolutely. One of the things that we're really hoping that people would do is that they would look for people on on expertise and interests that they're interested in and connect with those people, hopefully, to create projects, to start working on impact initiatives. That's really the main use case. Right. But, at this, and, but there's this other added value that you can check out events, you can see what's happening. So let's say you're flying to Paris next week. You can open up the app and see all of the events that are happening in France, if there's any at all, and then in Europe, and be able to connect with people face to face. Plus, you get the whole content from Singular Absolutely. that you have, right? Of Which course. is really cool. It's like, so my go to, honestly, my go to these days is like I open the app, go straight to the Hub content page, yeah. and just see like the, all the great articles. And they're really beautifully formatted for phone, so they're, they're, they're easy to read, and yep. you've got the content and right there, right? And they're actually curated based on the interests and the expertise that you've chosen in your profile. Right. So we're really trying to make your experience in the app extremely curated for you. And can you talk a little bit about what's in store for the... I know we've got bigger plans, right? It's not just like, hey, yes, I know. You're I'm on putting a sneak it, preview. Totally. <laughs> but I'm curious, like, what, what, where are we going with this thing? So really the vision is to enable our community to use this place as their hub. Mm -hmm. You go there to connect with people, to go to events, to um, get content, and then hopefully in the future to get things done. Right. So to connect with people so that you can actually get those projects out in the world and going. Um, still too early, but that's kind of the vision that we're working that's awesome. towards. Yeah. That's fantastic. So you can download the app right now, today. It's fully functional. It's amazing. It works on Android and iOS. Sorry, Windows Phone users. doesn't work. <laughs> uh, you have to go to the App Store and you look for what exactly? Singularity U Hub. So Singularity U Space Hub. Hub. Yeah. So do it now. You will not regret it. It's amazing. Heber, thank you so much thank for being so here. Thank you so much, Pascal. This was good. Thank you. See you all soon.